Hi, everyone. Today I have with me New York Times bestselling author Robert Dugoni. Hi, Robert. How are you today? I'm fine. Thanks for having me and thanks for accommodating my crazy schedule. <laughs> oh, no problem. I just have to, you know, I want to talk to you about your recent book, which I, I know you have another one coming out in this series, but The Trapped Girl is the most recent one, right, that anybody can get right now? It is. It came out uh, January 24th. And it's really, it's really doing spectacular. It's doing <laughs> oh my god! Extremely well. I, I got some numbers today from my publisher, and they were just thrilled. So it's, it's all good. I have to tell you, I've read a lot of thrillers in my time. You are the first author that I've interviewed that's written thrillers, but I've read a lot of thrillers, and I, <laughs> I was carrying the book around with me. And I couldn't put it down. Like, I couldn't put it down. So I was working out, right? And as I'm working, like, in between my sets, I kept picking it up and reading. And I have to tell you, the last third of the book is, like, every chapter at the end, I would cry. And I was like, I've never Uh, cried during thrillers before. But (laughs) as everything is unraveling, you know, I'm just like, I was so emotionally attached to what happened. It was crazy, you know? Oh, thank so, you. I, um, I've had people say to me that I write literary thrillers. Now, I've never heard that term before, um, but I, I take it as a, as a compliment. Um, you know, they, I actually, it was actually in a, in, a, in a review by a very well-known review service. They said that I write literary thrillers, which, you know, I translated, I think, means that I write thrillers that are character-driven. And not mm. necessarily action driven, but they're character driven and, and they depend a lot upon, you know, the relationship between the characters and the interaction between the characters. And I think, you know, all of us writers know that, you know, if uh, that's what that's what's most sentimental to a reader is, is the interaction between the characters, not necessarily the action um, you know, I go back to my dad. My dad was a huge movie buff, and we so I used to love to watch movies. But the movies I cried at were not the big war movies where the people survive at the end. The movies I cried at were the movies like, you know, The Song of Bernadette or um, um, uh, uh, um, what's the other one, Roman Holiday, where yeah. you have, you know, you have those those moments where between two characters that you know – can never be together, and you know those are the those are the things that I've always I, I grew up watching and I grew up reading, and I think they've found their way into my novels finally. Yeah, and I have to say, um, I you know normally I'm ADD enough that I have to go back and read the first one. Now I came across your book on Amazon; it popped up as you know you should read this book, and as soon as I got into it, I realized that it was a series, but. I think it's good that I did this because I can tell everyone that you don't need to do that. I mean, I would prefer to do that. I would prefer to start with book one of, of Tracy Crosswhite, but you don't have to to understand her. I got so emotionally attached to her, and I don't know, you know, I knew some of her history because you did put it in there, but you don't have to go back to the first one. I probably will because now I want to know more, you know, but it is a standalone book too. Yeah, and I, I think that's I think that's a, an author's job. Uh, I really do. Um, I I think that you know every single novel needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an ending. And I think it's unfair to a reader that to say, well, you're not going to understand this book unless you read my first book. Well, no, that's mm-hmm. that's your job as a writer. I mean, your job as a writer is to give a reader every time they pick up one of your books a complete novel, whatever that novel may be. And I really learned that, you know, honestly, from the J.K. Rowling books, the Harry Potter books. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, what I really came to realize is that a series is the, the continuation of the characters. It is not the continuation of the quest. You know, in every one of those quests, in every one of those books, um, Harry had a quest, whether it was to recover the Sorcerer's Stone or whether it was to recover the Goblet of the Fire or whatever. There was there was a quest. Now there was there was one overarching you know theme throughout, which was that Voldemort was going to exist. But every book you could pick up and you could read, and there would be a completed quest. And I thought she was just brilliant at that. You know, I thought she was brilliant at at allowing the reader to pick up any one of those books in this. I think there's seven, right? Any one mm-hmm. of those seven books in the series, and you could read it and be be satisfied and and feel fulfilled. 
Yeah, and it's the way you wove it into the story. It doesn't get started at the beginning where you were like, okay, so this is who Tracy is and this is what she does. It was more like it's, you know, you pick up the bits and pieces as, as you're revealing the rest of the story, you're also getting her backstory. So right. it, it, I, right. I love that. I love how you did that. And, um, and like I said, I became, I became so attached to her emotions and solving the mystery and, you know, solving the crime that I was, like I said, I was crying with her. Like I felt like I was with her crying about, because it was her passion about this stuff. And, you know, when, um, when I first came across you, okay, and I found out you were a lawyer first, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like, okay, John Grisham. Right. And then, but I'm like, Oh my gosh, but this is not John Grisham. This isn't John Grisham at all. This is so, I mean, I can't even express to you how much I love this book. So. Well, thank you. I think, I think, you know, as an author, we're always, we're always trying to figure out who we are when we start because we don't have any real benchmarks. I think it takes a tremendous amount of uh, courage when you have that Mm -hmm. author that gets out there and just says, I'm writing the book I want to write and people can like it or not like it. I think most of us go through a transformation where, you know, for me back in the day when I started writing the David Sloan series with the jury master, you know, it was back in the day when John Grisham and Scott Turow just really created a legal thriller and it was a very strong genre and it was like, okay, I'm going to write a legal thriller. Now mm-hmm. I'm at the point in my career and, and where I, I don't set out to write a legal thriller or a police procedural. I set out to write a book about characters, about the people and the interaction between them. And, but I think, that takes, I think that takes time for most writers. I think you know, for most writers, we need to figure out who we are. We need to find our legs. We need to find out who we are as writers and, and you know, what, what kind of writer we're going to be. So you know, you, you hit on, I think, which is very true. Early in my career, people always wanted to compare me to uh, Tarot or to uh, Grisham because I was a lawyer and I wrote legal thrillers. And now I, I don't get compared to anyone anymore. It's really it's really interesting. You know, Booklist and Kirkus and, and Library Journal, they never say, you know, he writes like so-and-so or this book is like so-and-so. They just they just talk about the book. And, and I, think that, I think that's an evolution that most writers – uh, if you're fortunate, you, you get to go through. Yes, absolutely. That's what I was thinking when I was reading it, because this is not a legal thriller, so I thought there would be more law in it. You know, I was like, well, he didn't really go back to his law. So, and I was a legal secretary for many, many years before I decided okay. to have six children. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, I always read legal, you know, because I liked it, because I liked the law. And so I did expect that, that it was going to have, you know, a lot of that, but it didn't. And I was, you know, I was shocked by it, but I didn't read your earlier, you know, the earlier stuff, but I was, I was like, this is so much different. It's, it's different than James Patterson. It's different than, you know, than John Grisham. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it was, I don't know. It was way more emotional. I've read a lot of James Patterson books, but I'm telling you, I was cr- like, as she's discovering stuff, I was in tears and I'm like, Oh my gosh, what is wrong? I mean, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Why am I so <laughs> emotional about this? But it was that well, that's you know, part of it. That, you know? Yeah. I think, it, I think it's always sad when you, you know, when you have, you have characters, not so much in jeopardy, but when you just have characters that, you know, are hurting or characters that are out of position in their lives, that you know it's it's sad and and I think um you know I think that's one of the things that I've kind of learned as a writer is you know stories are again not so much about about the stuff you know they're not so much about action and, and heroes and things like that you know it's really about the people in them and where they are in their lives and I think there's something I think there's something that's that's very fundamentally sad about a young woman that's in a marriage that's unhappy that that that's mm. that's, a, that's false you know I think there's something very sad about that, that that a lot of people in this world can relate to. Yeah, and I really thought that I knew what was going to happen, you know, three quarters of the way through the book, but you completely, you know, there's no way. There's no way I could have figured that out. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, there are some books when you're like three quarters, you're like, I know it. I know who, you know, I've watched enough. I've watched enough movies. I've watched enough TV shows. I know who did this. I got this. And it right. was completely, you know, and I love the way you wrote her diary before the chapter. Oh, I, I yeah, love that you. way of, you know, the, that you could kind of get into her head, but not not enough so you don't know, you know. 
And right. Thinking- and that was, you know, that was something that was hard for me because, um, you know, I had this 22 year old woman in Portland talking to me in my head and it was actually before I ever wrote the book, you know, mm-hmm. and it was one of those things where I finally just said, okay, you know what? I, I don't know what, why this person's in my head and, and why they feel compelled to talk to me. I don't even live in Portland. Uh, you know, it's kind of the weird thing about it. <laughs> and I just said, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to write it out. And, and I just, I just, I literally wrote about 75 pages with, of just letting this woman talk me through it. And that's really what, what helped me kind of piece the story together. Um, Trap Girl was a hard book for me to write, um, harder than my other books, because I really went into it not knowing, not knowing where I was going. Uh, I kind of mm. had this story in my head about Mount Rainier uh, because I had gone there. I had taken my son there just before he left for college. And I thought, what a cool place I could put, you know, I could have a story go here. And that didn't quite work out. And then I had this woman in Portland talk to me, and that didn't quite go out. And then I went to lunch with my two homicide detectives, and and one of them, Scott Tompkins, said to me, you know, you ought to write a book that starts with a woman in a crab pot. And I looked at him, and I said, (laughs) oh, my God, I I think I can. (laughs) Wow. that was the trigger. That was really the trigger. Wow. And, uh, you know, it, it... makes for just an incredible opening to a book but more than that it was really the trigger that compelled me to 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 push through and to bring all those storylines together and to create a full novel yeah and to be able to get into you know as a man to be able to get into a woman's head that like that i mean that's the part that i think was also so amazing was you know that i really felt like i was in her head but and i also felt like i was in tracy's head too you know and i was like oh you write women characters so well yeah, and I, I have to be 100% honest, which which is um, I don't try to write from the perspective of a woman. I, I just I, – I have four sisters. I'm married. I have a daughter. <laughs> uh, I, I've coached girls basketball, and, and I know fully that, you know, no matter what people say, um, boys and girls and men and women are not the same. We, we, are, we are not the same. But we are all human beings, and we all suffer the same um, – the same losses and we also you know we all applaud the the same successes and you know i didn't wasn't blessed to have as many children as you but as we were talking off the air you know Mm -hmm. um we we, whether it was my son or whether it was my daughter i you know they've both gone through the same trials and tribulations and it's just the fact that they're different sexes has really nothing to do with it um so you know i tried to really write from the perspective of someone that's really in either grievously injured or in, in just a really sad situation, male or female. I think it, like I said, I think it people, you know, people can relate to that. Um, and they've certainly related to Tracy Crosswhite and they've certainly related to the trap girl. And I've, I've received you know, a lot of emails, you know, sort of lamenting uh, the circumstances that, you know, they find themselves in. Mhm. And that's what I, when I when you come up with these stories, I mean, do your friends that are detectives help you with that or is that just you know like would that like you said that he told you about the crap the crab pot, but then yeah. the well, other thing that like, one he did. Get, that one he did. Yeah, no that one he definitely that one he definitely right. did. But uh, my agent actually came up with the idea for in the clearing. You know, she was talking about a hit and run accident and uh you know that they had they had uh, I think it was in New York City where they had kind of finally found a guy after you know 10 years where he he had driven a car and, and killed somebody and I thought wow that's got to be something painful to live with you know you, you giving you know, can you imagine there's a part of you you know obviously that you know if you are the type of person that would would drive off there's there's a part of you I'm sure that's thinking god I hope I never get caught I, I really don't want to go to prison what a horrible existence that would be in prison but then to have to live with that the rest of your life would just mm-hmm. be got to be horrific and so you know meg kind of came up with that idea um my homicide detectives are just terrific people for really for helping me go through the steps so i'll usually sit down with them and i'll say i'm thinking about doing a story on this you know and they'll say well why would you do that and why would you do this and we do this and we bring this person in and we bring that person Mm. in and we do this and you know do you need a contact to get in touch with someone like i just got through writing the, uh, the next book in the series which is called close to home and i needed a i needed a traffic invest traffic investigation 
uh, detective, and you know that's a person that goes out when there's when uh, there's a someone dies in a traffic uh, accident, and those people have you know a completely different um, job than you know necessarily a homicide detective, but they have you know a whole bunch of different you know techniques that they go through when they're trying to figure out you know why someone died in a traffic accident. So mm-hmm. they help me out a lot um, with with you know with a lot of the details, but. You know, I also recognize that, you know, not having ever been a cop, you know, I'm never going to get it 100% right. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy reading um, police books by by cops, you know, the ones that are really good. I just read one for an individual. And, you know, there's just, it, it's it's really the amount of, of um, the amount of equipment that police have at their fingertips now is, is really pretty amazing. But what it comes down to in the end is it comes down to the people. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what I hope people take from my book is it comes down from a, someone who's very dogged saying, you know, I'm not going to let this person get away with this. Mm-hmm. And that's her for the most, you know, that's yeah. what it seems like, you know, and that that's what her character does. But, okay, so when you were practicing law and you, and you did it for 13 years, um, what at what point did you realize, like, well, this isn't that much fun? Like, I definitely, <laughs> you know, and trust me, I know well, lawyers who come to that conclusion that it's yeah, not that much no, fun. So. I, 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 think, I think you can. I, I really do. Um, you know, it was a difficult decision for me because I never wanted to practice law in the first place. Um, mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to write in the seventh grade. I mean, that's really what I wanted to do. Uh, but I come from a family of compulsive overachievers. You know, I have nine brothers and sisters, and five of them are doctors. And so, wow. you know, there was just this, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was just this feeling of, well, you go on from college and you go to you go to graduate school. And uh, I had lived with two of them, um, you know, during internships and stuff that were doctors. And I kind of came to the conclusion, because that was back in the 80s when they just worked doctors to death, mm-hmm. that I, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, then I had a friend um, at Stanford who was going to law school, and it was kind of one of those things where I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll go to law school. So I was working for the L.A. Times at the time, and, and uh, I just I applied, and I got in, and I went to UCLA with him, and, you know, I looked at it as kind of another three years of college. Um, but then you do reach that point where you get out and you got to get on with your life. Uh, and I probably would not have practiced full-time for 13 years had it not been for the fact that, I got uh, I got uh, into a firm that was an up and coming firm. A lot of young people in the firm, and we just had a lot of fun. We had a lot of mm-hmm. fun. We, we tried cases, uh, you know. We talked about stuff. They were all sports nuts, and we'd go to lunch, and and I really had a good time. Um, mm. And so I might, you know, I might have still been there had it had it not been for this sort of this under under you know, uh, overarching, I guess is a better word, or, you know, just burning desire below me that, you know, I wanted to write, I wanted to try to write. And, um, and so I, you know, I just, I did, I just said, you know, I, this is, this is not what I set out to do with my life. Uh, and I need to go do what I set out to do. Yeah. And it's interesting to just, you know, not to try to do both at first, you know, just in case, like, didn't you just, you just did it. You just quit and, you know, right. Yeah, I never recommend that to people now when they come and say, can we have a cup of coffee? Uh, but really what I did was I I left the practice of law and I left the Bay Area and I moved to Seattle, which is where my wife's home is. And I just I, I was very blessed to have a number of circumstances that that really helped out. One was that we were able to live in my wife's grandmother's home. She had remarried and she had this beautiful home and she really wanted someone to take care of it. And so you know, we, we got to live there um, rent free. And, uh, you know, that was, that's a circumstance that most people are never going to get, but we right. got it. And, and I lived there, we lived there for about three years and I had the opportunity to really just write full time. Um, I had a, a son at the time that was about two years old. And then it, during the process of that three years, we, uh, my wife gave birth to our daughter, you know, but I, you know, when I finally got done, um, uh, you know, with those three years, I still wasn't a, uh, a published author, I, but I had I had content that I had completed, so that when that time came and I got my opportunity uh, and my you know I I, I got a chance, um, I said yeah I have this content and the agent that that uh, that I found loved it and it was kind of like off to the races, 
But um, I did work part-time in Seattle for about 15 years. I mean, I just stopped practicing law completely about three or four years ago with the success mm. of my sister's grave. But oh, prior okay. to that, you know, I, I needed to work, you know, part-time to support my wife and my, my family. My wife works as well. But, you know, mm-hmm. to support my kids and do all those kinds of things. And, and I don't regret it because, I, I again, I was lucky. I, I fell in with a really wonderful group of people, and I still keep an office uh, there, and I go in every day, and I write there. And, then you know, I'm surrounded by a lot of people that I really like. So I feel very mm-hmm. blessed. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, and I like young writers to hear that, too. You know, there's always different ways to go about it. And, you know, I've heard so many different stories about how, you know, they ended up doing it full time. But it's awesome to hear that you can get to that point where you can do it full time, because that's their dream right. anyway, is to, you know, be able to go into an office and just write, you know, that's, that's the goal, you know. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only aware of one overnight success. Uh, in all the years I've been writing, I've only heard one guy really, really an overnight success, and that was just a fluke of circumstances. Um, other than that, most of us are all working writers. We're we're people that are fighting to make a living, you know, fighting to to take care of our families, fighting to take care of our kids, and you, you know, it's it's a lot like any art, uh, whether it's mm-hmm. painting or whether it's acting. You know, you're you're constantly trying to get that one hit. And mm-hmm. I was just very, very fortunate. I mean, I worked very hard for it, and I worked a lot of years to get there. You know, My Sister's Grave, I think, was my eighth or ninth novel. I can't even tell you. And, and it hit. And when right. it hit, that, that was my opportunity. Um, John Lesquois, who's a friend of mine, you know, he hit when he wrote The Thirteenth Juror. And I don't know mm. what book that was in his, but it was like the eighth or ninth book. And that's how it is for most writers. Um, and mm-hmm. I, always tell, I always tell new writers, young writers, whatever – I always tell them that story that, you know, I, I will say to them, don't put yourself in a position where you're going to create anxiety or stress because mm-hmm. that's the one thing that you don't need. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of different ways to go about it, but I think most of us are working writers. And, and if we are fortunate enough to write full time, it's usually because, you know, one of our books hit. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I've always heard that too, you know, that you have to, I was uh, talking to this one guy, and he was like, you know, most people don't even read your stuff until you're on your third, fourth, fifth, you know, book. And and then he said, you go back to your first, and you're like, oh, that's why they didn't read it, (laughs) because I'm so much better now. Or they, (laughs) yeah, or or they suddenly pick up one of your books, and then they go back and read everything you've ever written, and they say, where have you been? (laughs) He said, I've been right here, (laughs) you know. Right. Uh, right. It's just it's it, it's it's like you know I have a friend that's a portrait photographer. He's probably one of the preeminent portrait photographers in the world. And you know Mike is just now like close to sixty, starting to really get his due. Mm-hmm. It just it just takes a lot of time and effort and struggle. And you know that's why they call it an art. You know it's it's not you don't go to engineering school and come out and be an engineer and go do deal with things that are are very you know. Um, very uh, concrete, you know, it's, it's very esoteric. You know, you're going to find people that love your stuff and you're going to find people that hate your stuff. Right. It, it's just, it's, 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 it's art. Um, the best advice I ever got was from my friend Phil Margolin down in Portland who said, you know, every, every uh, review of your book is a hundred percent accurate because it's that person's opinion. Mm. That's awesome. So, okay. Yeah. So you said Trap Girl is doing really well. Is it, has it been on the New York Times list? At the moment, so so the New York Times will not recognize Amazon publishers, um, and so I never I never um, I never really gauge the success of it through the New York Times. Um, oh. it, the New York Times made a mistake when my sister's grave came out, and uh, they I, I was on the New York Times with the jury master, so I, you know they knew my name, and then my sister's grave uh, was published by Thomas and Mercer, which is an Amazon publisher. And Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but uh, they apparently didn't realize that uh, I was with Thomas and Mercer, and the book was on the New York Times list uh, three straight weeks, um, which was really which was really fantastic. But the Trap Girl, uh, so so they won't they won't recognize uh, it. But uh, the Trap Girl was a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller, and it became I think a number one Amazon uh, bestseller. So um, it's done it's done extremely well, and um, I had never been the number one uh, number one Amazon 
I'm um, excuse me, number one Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, I had been in the Wall Street Journal top ten, but I had never been number one. So that was really a thrill. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't, you know what? I didn't even realize that that they were Amazon publishers because I see their name so much, and now it's, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, because of course, yeah. I'm on Amazon all the time, like everybody, every other reader, you know, that's going through. But yeah. I had no idea that that's so. Um, when well, two of us are nominated this year. The the seventh canon, my novel, seventh canon, is is nominated for an Edgar uh, Mystery Writers of America, and another. Another one of the five finalists is a Thomas and Mercer author. So, wow. you know, it, it's getting, I think it's getting more and more prevalent um, because it's, you know, I think um, it, it's getting more and more credibility. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's Patricia Cornwell. It, it could be wrong, but I think Patricia Cornwell is now with Thomas and Mercer and myself and, and some other really fabulous writers, um, Marcus Sakey. Uh, you know, there's, there's really good, good people out there putting out good books and, you know, everybody does things different ways, and everybody's careers takes different different paths and turns. And and I think it's ridiculous to get you know too excited about that kind of stuff. You know, if it's a good book, it's a good book, and I think we should exactly. be celebrating good books. Yeah, and I'm I'm happy that there are so many avenues now for writers because I've read some amazing self published books, published books. It doesn't matter. You know, there's there's different roads, but. It's like I'm so happy that that's around because now we just get to read the good books, you know. We get to right. read what the authors are writing, and, and that's what, you know, as a reader, that's what makes me happy, you know, that these authors yeah. can get out there and, you know, and do this. So, okay, so this one came out in January, right? Trap Girl came out in January? Correct. Correct. And then your next – what is the next one? I know that I saw it. I saw the cover. Maybe it's on your website that I saw the cover for the next one. Yeah, um, I don't know if we've come to come to an agreement on the cover yet, but it's called oh, Close okay. to Home, and it'll it'll be out in September. We I right before I left to come over for my daughter's bas- state basketball tournament, they had sent me some of uh, some ideas uh, on what the cover. Oh, but okay. They're anxious to get the cover up uh, on the next book, but it, it's uh, Close to Home. It'll be out in September. And it's another Tracy Crosswhite novel. And do you plan on, like, are you continuing? Do you have an end to her, or do you feel like she's going to keep going? I really don't. You know, um, it's interesting. I think when you write a series, uh, there's kind of two ways you can go. One is you can write the James Bond, Jack Reacher type series where, you know, the person evolves and changes during the course of the story. But mm-hmm. then when the next book is picked up, they're right back at the where they were at the very beginning. You know, they're they're not <laughs> engaged, they're not married, they have no no love interest, they have no kids. You know, it just it starts over, and then so the the person always starts from the same place. Um, I didn't I didn't really want to do that. So Tracy's continuing to evolve throughout the course of my novels. You know, she goes from living alone with only her cat Roger as her as her companion to, you know, meeting Dan who becomes her love interest and things develop there and things develop in the trap girl and things Mm -hmm. continue to develop, you know, in, um, in close to home. And, and so I'm just having, my characters are just kind of evolving and changing now. I mean, I guess there could come a point where someone could say, you know, she's, She's 65, but I'll worry about that when it happens. <laughs> I was going to say, don't your fans want you to keep, like, I'm sure you get, you know, tons of emails, like, please, let's, you know, keep writing her series and, you know, because they become attached to her, you know, so I'm sure you're Oh, yeah, they're very head. attached to her. Yeah, yeah. No, people are very attached to her. And and, uh, and I enjoy writing. I enjoy writing her and I enjoy writing the series. And so I'm just going to keep, you know, I'm just going to keep plugging away. I have, um, I have four more books with Thomas and Mercer, and I hope I'll have many, many more. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. I, you know, I, I can't tell anybody enough, like, you need to go get this book. It's amazing. I read it so fast. I can't, <laughs> you know, it is a fast <laughs> read, but you will enjoy every minute of it. So uh, thank well, you thank so you much. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thanks. And hopefully we'll be talking thank to you, you for soon. Having me. Yes, thank you. We'll talk to you soon, okay? All righty. Bye-bye. All right, have a great day. Bye.